as we're talking about going in this series, I want to ask you a question. What kind of people do you enjoy being around? Grumpy, cynical, down in the mouth types of people? That's the people you like to spend the majority of your time with. If you say, I don't know any people like that, it's probably you. Um, Or encouraging, positive, kind types of people. The one that make, the type that makes you want to kind of love everybody and love everything in the world. We've been talking about being a people that go. But what do going people look like? So I want to be, us as a church in focus, I want us to be going people. But going people is something we are just as much or maybe more than it is something that we do. Going people is who we are more than it is what we do. And because of who we are, there is something that we do. So it ties together. But if by grace, through faith, you have given your life to Jesus Christ, he is Lord and Savior of your life, and you're becoming the person that Jesus died for you to become, then here's what we should look like. God will use your life as you go. Week one, we talked about the Great Commission saying, go and make disciples. And that phrase, go, basically meaning as you have already gone. That's what that means, go. Or that's the the proper way would be having already gone, after you have gone. So what this is saying is this isn't a suggestion for believers that we would go. It's an imperative. It's a given. After you have gone. That as a believer, you will go into the world, not to be of it, but to fully engage in it. And as we engage our world as people with the light of Christ shining out of our lives, then we should be people that others are drawn to. What does that look like? What does it look like to have the light of Christ shining out of your life? That's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Because who you are as you go will have a greater impact than just going and trying to be who you think you're supposed to be. Because oftentimes, right, we, we go do things because we think, well, this is the right thing to do. Or I go to church, so I should go do this. Or that's really cool, I should go to Memphis. That sounds like something I should do. But who you are is going to impact what you do. And as you go, it's going to have an impact on the place. Did you realize that different locations don't change who you are? But who you are can change the atmosphere in different locations. So I don't want to send a bunch of going people that think they're going just because it's the right thing to do. I want to send a going people that already are going because that's who they are. This is why we take the gospel of peace, which Ephesians 6 says that we put and fit our feet with, the gospel of peace. That's what we walk into every situation with. We take the peace of God into the situations because that's who we are as we go. This was the epitome of who Jesus was. Man, what I love about Jesus is that he was so natural in being countercultural. He was so natural at being countercultural, at being loving, at being merciful and just all at the same time, which is really hard to do. How normative it was for him to go to places that nobody else would go, to speak with people that nobody else would speak to, to spend time and elevate and draw near to people that everybody else marginalized and ostracized. He was a going person who was going and doing the will of God the Father. And he was able to find some kind of common ground with anybody and everybody. It was amazing that he could find common ground with people that everybody else said, we've got no common ground with them. And yet Jesus was able to find common ground with all those that he met. He met them exactly where they were to see them with eyes of compassion and to mercifully respond to their situation in life and bring life to them. That's what I love about Jesus. So normal in being supernatural. This whole series is about how we are able to do the same, that we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what God's Word says, that we would follow in the footsteps of Jesus, how as Christians in this world, but not of it, we are commissioned to go. And as those who have already gone, we would tell the story of what Christ has done inside of us. 
We must gather. That's what we're doing today. That's what we've been doing really all weekend long. If you participated, man, you've had a lot of gathering here at In Focus Church this weekend. On Friday night, we had the collective, the ladies had the collective, and it was right out there. It was beautiful. Worship in the round. We had a tremendous time of worship and then testimony. One of our friends from Memphis was here, Joanna. She was up on the stage with Carla, and they did a phenomenal job telling the story of what Christ had done in her life and how God was using her to be a light. And then the next morning, Guys, whatever, for whatever reason, like to get up late and have breakfast late. So we had a great turnout of guys Saturday morning at 10 a.m. If you were still sleeping, get up, man. What an amazing time of gathering. And here we are today gathering together in the name of Jesus so that what? We could say we went and gathered? No, so that we can be going people. So we gather and we go. And we've been demystifying what it really means to go. What does it mean to go and make disciples? Because we think, oh, that's something for the professionals. No, it is for something that everybody that calls on the name of Jesus is to do. We're all given the ministry of reconciliation. So we've kind of been unpacking that. That's why one week we use the acronym SALT. What do I do? Start a conversation. Ask questions. Listen. And then tell your story. The story of the gospel. What Christ has done for you. And then we talked about following in the footsteps of Jesus and use the acronym STEPS, that we would see people really lift up our eyes from our mobile devices literally and just look and see what God would want us to see. And then to trade places with people, to walk in their shoes so that we can what? Empathize with them, pay the price like the good Samaritan with time and effort and seek the lost as Jesus is seeking the lost. If you missed any of that or want to review that, you can always go back and watch them online or listen to the podcast. But today I want to continue to exhort you, to implore you, to encourage you, and to equip you to find common ground with those around you as you go. Because you already should be going as a believer in Jesus Christ. So I want to go back to what I said a moment ago, that who you are will either make your going easier and genuine or harder and fake. Who you are will make your going either easier because you're empowered by the Holy Spirit and genuine because it's a real work that God's done in your heart or it's going to be hard because you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit and it's going to be fake because you haven't been transformed yourself. You're just doing. And the gospel is about what Christ has done, not what you do. So the Bible tells us, and if you'll turn with me to Micah chapter 6, verse 8, this is one of my favorite verses, one of the favorite verses of my family, and it's found in the Old Testament, that's Micah chapter 6, verse 8, and I'm not sure there's a better description of the kind of people that we're supposed to be as we go, the kind of people that we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus Christ than the one that this prophet gave almost 3,000 years ago. Simultaneously, I don't know if there's anything more impossible to be than what this scripture says we're to be. Outside of the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit empowering us. So here's what it says, Micah 6, 8. It says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now I want to do a little contextual work this morning so that we can better understand how powerful this message was and is. Like, how was this spoken? To whom was it spoken? And rest assured, I want you to know as we go through a little bit of the backstory of when this was spoken, that whenever God is asking us to do something for him, one thing in the world, what is going on in the world is probably the exact opposite. Because when God is telling you to shine forth like bright lights... It is into the darkness that you're shining. Light doesn't shine except into the darkness, and it shines the brightest. So here's what God is telling the prophet Micah to share. And here's the context. So we'd had King David, we'd had King Solomon. Things were going great for the most part. At least the people of Israel were flourishing. Solomon dies. Rehoboam, one of his sons, takes the throne. So typically whenever there's a change in leadership, and we understand this, the people think, well, now we can get what we want. Now we can ask for something. That was the king before, that was the president before, that was the commissioner before, now we got a new one, so let's ask what we've been wanting to ask. 
This is the context in which the people come to Rehoboam and ask him something they want. So here, this is found in 1 Kings chapter 12. You don't have to turn there. It'll be up on the screen. Verse 4, here's what they said. Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Now, this seems like a legitimate request, right? This doesn't like, okay, cool. Lighten the load. Historians actually are really split on whether or not this was a legitimate request from the standpoint of whether their load was really all that heavy. Or because what was going on was that Solomon was beginning to worship other gods. They didn't even really care about that. All they cared about was whether or not their load was going to be lightened. Isn't that kind of how we are? We really don't care about what's going on all around us. We care about what your power is, how it's going to affect me. And they're saying, listen, we don't really, I, all that other stuff's going on in the nation, flourishing, great. How are you going to help me feel better? But here's the reality. It doesn't matter if, the, if that was their motivation or if things really were bad. I don't know. But I do know our responses to both true and untrue statements matter nonetheless. I'll say that again. Your responses to both true and untrue statements matter the same. Rehoboam says he'll consider the quest. That's what he does. And he seeks some counsel. First, he gets counsel from the old guys. He goes to the people that served his father, the people that have had a lot of experience. And he says, hey, this is what they're asking. What do you think? Here's their response. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. No matter what the motivation of the people's request Here's what they're saying. This is actually good counsel. They're saying, serve the people and they'll serve you. Sounds like the golden rule, doesn't it? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Just serve the people and they'll serve you. Except Rehoboam did not like the idea of being a servant of the people because historically we see over and over again, power corrupts. Power doesn't usually help. Power corrupts. And so Jesus comes later on, and we'll talk about that, to show what power really looks like. What we have often seen in history and what Rehoboam is feeling is that I don't want to serve under. I don't want to have power under. I want to have power over. So Rehoboam does what all of us are tempted to do. When we have our minds made up and we've decided what we want to do and and the good counsel we receive conflicts with what we want to do, we go get a second opinion. Oh, yeah, I've already got my mind made up, and that sounds really good. That sounds very godly, but I'm going to find somebody that will give me what I want to hear. So that's what he does. He goes to his peers, the people that he grew up with, and they said, here's what they said. The young men who had grown up with Rehoboam replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. That sounds like a horrible idea. And although that sounds like a horrible idea for a king that wants God to be on their side, Rehoboam decides that this is vice that he's going to follow. Oh, yeah. That's what I, now, that's what I decided I wanted to do to begin with. And he does so with catastrophic effects. So the conflict and the polarization in that nation began to be much worse. They began to be more divided than they'd ever been. They were weak and they were prone to attack. They were split now like never before between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And it was in this context that Micah spoke these words. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So what does this have to do with you and me today? Well, Jesus gives his disciples, which now includes us, some similar instruction and counsel when it comes to being disciples and even those that have been given influence and power in this world today. Years go by. Here's the reality. Years go by from the prophet Micah, and now Jesus is walking the earth, and nothing really changes. There's, there's nothing different about humanity and our propensities to take power and to abuse it. Because without Christ, sinful humanity is always the same. There's always going to be cultural conflicts. There's always going to be a temptation to misuse power. There's always going to be an inclination in us to mistreat other people we consider different or lesser than us. Yet the message from Jesus and still today is the same. 
Matthew chapter 20, fast forward. Jesus called his disciples together and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what does that mean for us now? Well, let's ask ourselves, what kind of world do we live in right now? What kind of world are we walking around in our context? Everything's good? Feel like we all love each other? All getting along? All, you know, excited about elections? I feel like there's a bomb right underneath the surface, if you will, of the world that's ticking away and waiting for the smallest thing to trigger it or diffuse it. And what kind of people are we going to be? Are we going to be those that just speed up the process? You ever seen those movies, right, where they've got that time bomb and it's ticking down and the clock's going down and typically what happens is they snip a wire and the clock starts going faster. That's the first wire. They're like, you know, and you're, the tension's building and you're like, oh, what's going to happen? Well, typically, unless it's a terrible movie, they're going to figure out how to stop it, right? Are we going to diffuse it or are we going to speed up the process of the explosion? Because as we go into the world, there is still cultural conflict just like in Micah's day, just like in Jesus' day. We're still plagued by the misuses and the abuses of power. We are still polarized. We're still divided by all kinds of tribalism. We're still separated into different kingdoms, if you will. But if we heed the words of the prophet Micah, if we heed the words of our Savior because God loves people and he wants to use our lives for his purposes, we're going to begin to naturally find common ground with other people that God is drawing to himself. When you are committed to doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God in a world that is unjust, lovers of ourselves, and full of pride, we're naturally going to find people being attracted to our lives. They're going to want to hear what we have to say because they have seen what our lives have said. Why, why do you do what you do? I think the biggest stumbling block to the gospel many times, is it that the people are conflicted with what the Bible says? They're conflicted with what we say and what we post and what we do. Because if they could see Jesus as he truly is, if they could hear the good news of the gospel and see it lived out with justice and mercy and humility, they would be drawn to what we were drawn to. Our behavior in the middle of cultural conflict, our behavior in the middle of an election year, our behavior at a sporting event can cause people to quickly turn to something else because they don't see justice, they don't see mercy, and they don't see humility being displayed in the lives of those who say they should be living it. But if we would follow Micah's mandate, if we would follow Jesus' instruction, I think we'd find people wanting to know more about who we are and subsequently more about the Jesus that we serve. So let's just talk about those three things. Yeah, you can applaud that this morning. Again, if you're new here, it is okay to applaud Jesus and his word. It's like, we're like, do we clap? Yes, you can. Is God good? Yes, he is. Is his word powerful? Yes, it is. Does it matter if it's me or anybody else delivering it? No, it doesn't. Okay, let's do justice. Justice is the basis of all moral law in life. To do justice means to know and to seek justice and the righteousness of God in our lives and in the lives of people around us. True justice is done with love, not some sort of ulterior motive. And it's with a desire to honor and to glorify God alone. Conversely, injustice breaks and destroys the moral law, and it hurts people made in the image of God. Injustice should cause us to be angry, as a matter of fact. And it mars the beauty of God in the earth, which is why there should be a righteous indignation whenever we see something that is not like God intended it to be. 
The Bible tells us that the system of this world is broken everywhere. Consequently, guess what that means? We will have ample opportunities to do justice. And it doesn't matter what form of government that we find ourselves in, there is still broken systems all around us that are affecting people made in the image of God. And we, as the people of God, as we go, have the opportunity to do justly and to bring the righteousness of God into situations that it isn't. I would be remiss if I did not mention that it's hard to do justly until we have first been justified ourselves. Now listen, Uh uh-oh, that went down wrong. Somebody's clearing your throat for me. Let's all do it together. Thank you, misery loves company, I appreciate that. We are made just by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, not by the just things that we do. And once we've experienced the justice of God in our own lives through the shed blood of Jesus, then we are called to do it with our lives, to do justly, to do justice. Because of what Jesus has done, this is what we must do. And to do justice is to be committed to the word of God. It's to be committed to God and his word. And guess what we know? So, well, what, what, am I, what do you mean? What part of God's word? Here's what we know. Jesus boiled it down very simply. All the law and everything in this hangs on this one thing. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So how do I do justly? He's saying, everything in here hangs on this. Love me and love people the same way. Love your neighbor. And here's the point. When it comes to how we find common ground with others, this is why we do justice. When you stand up for those that are being harmed by injustices, when we reach out to those who are being treated unjustly to help them, when we are concerned and we care for others more than ourselves and we prove it with our actions... What we're going to find is that the moral truth that is written on the hearts of every human being because of the image of God is going to be drawn to that type of life. It is in those moments where we're doing justice and it draws someone to see that, that we have the privilege to share the reason for our actions. Here's why I do what I do. I've yet to do justice in my life where the one who I was standing up for or the one that I was caring for or the one that I was helping wasn't either grateful, moved, or endeared to me enough that they wanted to know why I was doing what I was doing. The why behind the what. There are all kinds of opportunities to do justice in this world. And we will be doing justice until Jesus returns and makes everything right. And we must be about it because that is the heart of God for us. And that is the type of life that attracts others to a just God. Amos 5, another powerful verse, 24. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. I love that simile. Why? Because justice and righteousness are always linked together in God's word. And just like all of life flourishes, whether it's plant life or animal life, where there is water, human life flourishes where there is justice and righteousness. And if you want to see where life is not flourishing, then I'll show you a place where justice and righteousness are not flourishing. This brings us to a second action that God will use to draw others as you go. Here we are as going people. Going people do what? They do justice and they love mercy. I think the, the wording here and the order is important because typically we love when justice is served, except in our own lives. Then we want mercy. We love it when other people get justice, but give me mercy. And as humans, we're prone to want that. I want justice for everyone, but I want mercy for myself. And it can also be said that those that are seeking justice have a tendency, tendency to become unmerciful in their passion and zeal for justice. So brilliantly, God doesn't stop with justice. And aren't you glad? Because justice says I deserve stuff that I don't even want to think about that I deserve. But he says, love mercy. And notice he doesn't say do mercy. He said, do justice. 
love mercy. Because mercy is always going to be greater. Again, I'll point out this impossible thing that God's called us to do without Jesus and his Holy Spirit. It is impossible, my friends. I'm not telling you something you don't know. It is impossible to love mercy. Except for ourselves. It is impossible to love mercy for others. We cannot, again, love mercy until we have first experienced mercy. And how do we experience mercy? Through the receiving of new life in Christ. We receive mercy. I was thinking about this. I heard it said this week, and I was thinking about this scenario of I lay down to go to sleep, like most of you all do probably, I hope, every night. We lay down. And we're in a position basically of the same way we will be positioned when we die. Laying down. You don't, they don't position you standing up when you die, just in case you, that's, that would be really weird. That'd be some odd form of taxidermy or something. That's strange. You lay down, but then every morning you get up. And what does the Bible say about God's mercy? It's new every morning. Because every night you lay down And you let God be God. And you go to sleep. You die to yourself. That's why you rest. And then you get up and you rise up and the mercy of God is new for you that morning that you woke up and that you can live for him. Just a side note. Justice is defined as someone getting what they deserve while mercy means we don't get what we deserve. And God has been merciful to us so we're to be merciful to others. Loving mercy means we practically overlook insults and attitudes that typically make broken relationships stay broken. When we love mercy, we're quick to forgive others. Mercy fuels compassion, which when exercised is like little beams of light breaking through the darkness of our world. It's kindness and empathy breaking down barriers of misunderstanding and mistrust. Mercy chooses not to be offended and compassionately sees a hurting heart behind hurtful words. And if you're sitting there going, yeah, but you don't know about what they did and you don't know about the situation, then I want you to know that's, that's typical. Now what are we leaning towards? Justice. And God says, no, love mercy. Do justice. But love mercy. God's mercy is reflected in the cross of Christ where Jesus died for those who were ungodly. That wasn't fair. It's a direct reflection of his love for you. His mercy is an expression of love, an act of kindness, a compassion towards us. And that's what our mercy is supposed to look like. Psalm 103, it's a powerful picture of God's mercy. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Thank you. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. Thank you. Yes. I'm so thankful that God doesn't treat me the way my sins deserve or repay me according to the things that I've done knowingly wrong against him. Though his judgment is merited. Get this. His judgment towards us is merited. But his mercy is greater. Again, it's impossible for us not to treat others' sins as they deserve without God's help. So we need the grace of God to help us walk in his ways, to do justice and to love mercy. To love mercy means we look for the smallest reason to extend it to other people. If we love mercy this way, we'll continually find ourselves, watch this, reaching out to people that we may have otherwise been at odds with or hostile towards. Because mercy will have come into our hearts and our minds in such a way that we're able to do something that without the mercy of God being poured out in our lives, we would never do otherwise. And you believe, believe me, that is a testimony of the power of God. People want to know how you're able to do that. I was reading a book by a Croatian theologian by the name of Miroslav Volf. He's still living today. 21st century theologian. He was wrestling with the impossibility of exacting justice against and extending mercy towards his enemies, the same people during the Serbian and Croatian War. 
He, as a Croatian, was dealing with the Serbians that were doing a lot of things in this particular, obviously war is horrific in any setting, but he said, I'm watching my countrymen, my, the people in my country being raped and killed and imprisoned. So he's doing a presentation at his, I believe, seminary, and he's talking about the Good Samaritan and loving your neighbor. And at the end of his wonderful presentation, as he said, his professor looked at him and he said, does that neighbor include the Serbian? Here's what he said. Listen to this. You can read it too. My thought was pulled in two different directions by the blood of the innocent crying out to God and by the blood of God's lamb offered for the guilty. How does one remain loyal both to the demand of the oppressed for justice and to the gift of forgiveness that the crucified offered to the perpetrators? I felt caught between two betrayals. The betrayal of the suffering exploited and excluded and the betrayal of the very core of my faith. I'm just let that hang there for a minute. Can you imagine what happens when this type of impossibility where justice and mercy collide is answered with the wisdom and the grace and the power of God in the life of the one who has surrendered to him. Can you imagine how much light begins to shine into darkness and how much of a testimony that person that is going is living in front of others? As we do justice and love mercy and freedom and forgiveness flow, people's lives are changed. And then finally, we walk humbly. Because again, if we're doing justice and we're loving mercy and we're beginning to do it really well, there is a tendency for us, even when we do stuff well for God, to go, I'm kind of holy. I'm kind of a big deal. Humility is not a popular characteristic anymore. It's like like being a braggadocious punk is normative and accepted. I remember when everybody laughed at Muhammad Ali back years ago when he said he was the greatest of all time. Everybody's, man, that's ridiculous. Now everybody's the goat. I mean, like your, your, your middle schooler's the goat because they kicked a, like a soccer ball into a net on the playground. I'm the greatest of all time! Dude, you can't even spell goat. But when we do exercise humility in our lives, it can be wrongly mistaken for weakness. I love the definition of humility as not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And when it comes to our approach to others and how we go about our lives, walking in humility sees the value of every other person, every other human being, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their background. Walking in humility sees others first and it sees ourselves last. And guess what that does? When you walk in humility, it creates a level of trust with people. So when it comes to creating common ground with them, that humility is going to cause them to want to speak with you because you've already listened to them. James 4 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Don't you think that if God opposes the proud that people are going to oppose proud people? I mean, who likes proudful, prideful people? It's off-putting. Humility gives us the best opportunity for others to listen to what we have to say. It builds the common ground. Jesus said, for those that exalt themselves will be humble, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Church, in focus, we must do justice, love mercy. As much as we love for what God's done for us, that we would love mercy for others and walk humbly with God. And my hope and prayer that as we do that in Focus Church, we would embody this Christian ethic and this character of Christ. And when we do, when we do this as we go, because this is who we are, by God's grace, we're gonna find ourselves in situations that God leads us into to use us to share the gospel with others that so desperately need to hear the good news. We'll find others coming to see why the light of Christ is shining so brightly out of our lives into the darkness of the world that we find ourselves in. We're going to find common ground with anybody that God orders our steps to encounter, no matter their age, their ethnicity, 
their economic background, their education, their nation of origin. God can use your life to lead them to Christ. If who we are as we go are those that do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. There's going to be all kinds of testimonies all around your lives. Here's what I'm trying to empower and encourage you today. This isn't about somebody else. This is about you. It's what God wants to do in you and through you and us together as a church. You're not doing it alone. We're doing this together as the body of Christ. And he's going to reach your family. He's going to reach your friends. He's going to reach your coworkers. He's going to reach people that you didn't even know. He's going to reach your enemies as the blood of the lamb is being spilled for those around us as it was spilled for you and me. Do justice. God, give us opportunities to do justice. Love mercy. Holy Spirit, help us to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. God, as we humble ourselves, would you exalt us at the proper time so that you can receive the glory 